Hello everybody. So I'm George from Ireland, carrying on my English law channel. So I was talking about statutory uh, interpretation, well, a declaration of incompatibility. When um, a court, particularly the Supreme Court, finds that um, United Kingdom legislation um, is inconsistent with the European Convention of Human Rights. So that's what it's incompatible with. Uh, anyway, so um, the, the court simply makes that declaration of incompatibility, but that doesn't mean that that law is inoperable. It remains on the statute uh, book, statute book. So um, section 4.6 of the Human Rights Act said that um, if there's a declaration of incompatibility, this is what happens. A declaration under this section, a declaration of incompatibility, does not affect the validity, continuing operation or enforcement of a provision in respect of which it was given. It is, bind it, it is not binding on parties to the proceedings in which it is made. So supposing we're talking about blah, blah law, and the court says, Declaration of Incompatibility, we can't interpret this in a fashion which um, is consistent with the European Convention of Human Rights. They issue that declaration, blah, 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 law is still valid. And in that case, it still applies. So somebody who's hoping to defeat blah, 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 law in this case is, is going to get nowhere. It, it's still going to be enforced against him. Right. So um, this doesn't oblige anything, the, the government to do anything, the Declaration of Incompatibility. They don't have to repeal or reformulate the said piece of legislation, but it would often lead to courts to do so. Um, here's a case in point, Bellinger and Bellinger, a 2003 case before the UK House of Lords. So uh, the court had to look at the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1973, and that said um, that the marriage is between a male and a female. So um, uh, the, was this compatible with convention rights? Remember, Article 8 of the European Convention on Rights says that there is a right to respect for family, family life, and everybody is, is entitled to wed and found a family. So how about Mrs. Bellinger? Mrs. Mrs. Bellinger was um, a born male, but he became a she, was a transsexual. So um, the... Uh, the uh, House of Lords said there's a, there's an issue of incompatibility here because um, uh, people who have um, undergone uh, gender reassignment weren't allowed to, to marry a person of what was now the opposite sex. Anyway, this, this was uh, dealt with by the Gender Recognition Act in 2004, but Mrs. Bellinger, a, been a, Mr. Been a man originally, was legally recognised as a woman and allowed to marry someone of the opposite sex, i.e. a male. Um, so, unusual, I know. All right, so there is a way to uh, speed up the whole thing. At, uh, and if you look at Section 10 of the Human Rights Act, it says there's the power to take remedial action. And this allows governments to amend law, sometimes through a remedial order. So um, they can even um, make amendments to primary legislation. The minister, um, and it says if the minister considers there are compelling reasons to do so. So this is what people call the Henry VIII clause. And sometimes this is worrying because it's allowing the executive to change legislation at will. This ought to be a, a legislative process, not an executive process. It's a, a worrying concentration of, of power in the hands of the executive. It's wrong. It ought to be debatable before Parliament. It, it is really undermining parliamentary sovereignty, which we thought was indefeasible. Right. So um, anyway, so some people think it's good if we, can, if we want transparency, that um, uh, almost all of these amendments are made through Parliament and they're not made by the executive. So uh, we have, have to realise that in most cases, when there's a declaration of incompatibility, the um, statute uh, will be changed by Parliament. But anyway, uh, so it might be too late for the person who was hoping this would happen a bit sooner for a case. So um, if you feel that your um, uh, rights under the Convention have been breached, well, then the House of Lords might uh, could refer the matter to the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, anyway, so remember that can only happen once you've gone through your national court system. So there are other times when the courts say there's um, incompatibility, but they decide that they're going to use their discretion. Um, under Section 4.5 of the Human Rights Act and choose not to make a declaration of incompatibility. For instance, there's a whole thing about prisoners not allowed to vote because the European Court of Human Rights said the UK's attitude, whereas if you're serving a term of imprisonment, you're not allowed to vote at all. The European Convention of Human Rights said, no, that's unacceptable. You have to allow some prisoners to vote. Who? We allow it up to you. Could it be those serving under a one-year sentence? Could it be those who've served a long sentence and only got two years to go or what? Are non-violent offenders or what? 
you decide. But this blanket ban on the more voting is no longer permissible. And the UK still hasn't changed that. If you're being held on remand in prison, i.e. awaiting trial, then you are permitted to vote currently. But that's not enough for the European Court of uh, Human Rights. So um, uh, anyway, because this, this came to, to the Supreme Court, it was um, a case called R on the application of Chester and Secretary of State for Justice, or another case, McGill and Lord President of the Council and another, a 2003 case, 2013 case, sorry, which went to the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court decided that it would not um, make a declaration of incompatibility um, uh, pertaining to Section 3 of the Representation of the People Act, 1983. Now, the Representation of the People Act has had about six iterations, which is important we, we say which one, 1983. The very first one, very first Representation of the People Act, is 1832, commonly called the Great Reform Act, even though that's not its official name. Um, so the Representation of the People Act 1983 said that people in prison are not allowed to vote. Although um, I think they hadn't been allowed to vote beforehand, but there was no act st statute actually saying that. So um, anyway, so remember Article uh, the uh, um, Article of Protocol 1 saying, you know, got the right to vote. Um, the Scottish Court of Session um, had already uh, made a declaration of incompatibility in 2007 in this case called Smith and Scott. You could look at another relevant case on uh, Nicholson, sorry, Nicholson and Ministry of Justice 2014, which again made it to the Supreme Court. Um, so this was a most contentious issue. It was about um, assisted suicide. So some people are very, very ill, paralyzed, whatever, terminally ill in great agony. They want to end their lives, but they can't physically do so. They can't lift anything or imbibe anything without help. Are you allowed to help someone commit suicide? And that's illegal. So, um, but anyway, the Supreme Court um, uh, decided um, that they would um, uh, not issue a, a declaration of incompatibility on this case. So, um, yeah, your case can go to the European Court of Human Rights, but that's very unusual. So let's look at Section 6 of um, the Human Rights Act. It's about public authorities. Remember, um, it's illegal for public authorities, which and, and that means courts too, to behave in a fashion which is um, inconsistent with the uh, European Convention of Human Rights unless primary legislation says that they must do so, as in behave in a manner which goes against the ECHR. So the um, uh, public authorities, they have to um, uphold the UK's um, duty, according to Article 1 of the ECHR. I wouldn't remember that, what that duty is. Here's a quotation. Secure to everyone within their jurisdiction the rights and freedoms defined in this convention. So what's a public authority? Remember, this is crucial. There are co core public authorities that are very easy, government ministries, anything directly controlled by the state, like the army, but it also includes hospitals, old people's homes, and things like that. Anything which is acting, uh, which is affecting public authority is acting in a, in a quasi-state manner, even if it's not actually an emanation of the state, even if it's not a statute saying, statute saying that it is a state agency in any sense. So there was a prominent case about this, YL and Birmingham City Council 2007, went to the House of Lords. There was a care home run by a private firm, but it had some people who were there who paid for by the taxpayer. So uh, the local authority, the local council, was paying for these old folks to be looked after there. So the House of Lords found by three to two that um, the uh, people there, because they're put there by the public, um, um, they, they were put there by local authorities, but that did not make the care home a public authority. Interesting. If it was a publicly run care home, it would be, even though most residents were there publicly funded, the care home was not a public authority. So that would that surprise some people, that one. Um, OK, so um, anyway, the, after that, there was the Health and Social Care Act in 2008, um, and that um, changed the decision in YL by saying that um, in from now on, care homes are regarded as public authorities. Um, uh, in, in, in relation to the Human Rights Act, um, because they provide care on behalf of public bodies, even if not all their um, uh, patients are publicly funded. Okay, so anyway, uh, section six of the same, the Human Rights Act, um, point three, what does it say? Um, then it does not include uh, the other House of Parliament or person exercising functions in connection with proceedings in Parliament. So Parliament, they can make laws which fly in the face 
of the uh, European Convention on Human Rights. So, um, so parliamentary sovereignty is um, preserved. So remember, courts in the UK, they cannot um, thwart uh, parliamentary legislation. It's valid. So um, anyway, uh, what, what can be done? So um, the courts can do two things if, if, the, if the statute goes against the ECHR. They uh, interpret the laws where they can in a way that is compatible with the conventional rights. Sometimes they say we're adopting a teleological approach, as in teleos is like far away in Greek, seeing what the aim is and going towards that. Um, or, or the other one is to, to issue that declaration of incompatibility, um, according to Section 4 of the Human Rights Act. So, um, though that this would encourage Parliament to change the legislation, Parliament is not legally mandated to do so. Um, but often uh, it leads to political calls to uh, sort the situation out. So the Human Rights Act, in the Section 7, it talks about people who have um, standing, locus standi, as in to, to bring a case. You have to have sufficient interest in a case. So um, it introduced a new test. Um, previously, there'd been a test at common law. So Section 7 said only someone who's a victim of an act can bring a case. Um, uh, victim w w within within the um, signification of, of Article 34 of the ECHR. So um, uh, the European Court of Human Rights, it doesn't allow pressure groups or um, clubs and things like that to, to bring cases unless um, it would be a, a victim of whatever legislation they claim is incompatible with the ECHR. This is what Article 34 of the ECHR says. The court may receive applications from any person, non-governmental organisation, or group of individuals claiming to be a victim of a violation by one of the high contracting parties, and the right set forth in the Convention, or the protocols thereto. The high contracting parties undertake not to hinder in any way the effective exercise of that right. I always nod when I come to the end of a quotation. So the high contracting parties are the member states, or the signatories, rather, of the ECHR. Um, so bear in mind that public authorities can never be regarded as victims. So your local council, a government department, the Navy, or whoever, hospitals, they can't say, I'm a victim of this legislation. They would have no locus stando. So, okay, their statements of compatibility, according to Section 19 of the HRA. That's what Section 19.1 says. A minister of the Crown in charge of a bill in either House of Parliament must, before the second reading of the bill, make a statement to the effect that, in his view, the provisions of the bill are compatible with convention rights, or make a statement to the effect that although he is unable to make a statement of compatibility, the government nevertheless nevertheless wishes the House to proceed with the bill. So we'll always know in advance of this legislation going through whether it is in, it's compatible or incompatible in the, in the um, opinion of a Minister of the Crown. It could be a Secretary of State, it could be a, could be a, a Minister of State. So um, uh, this uh, step, it um, means that the Parliament examines it all the more carefully. Um, so uh, the bill doesn't actually have to be compatible with the ECHR. Now look at the Humani Communications Act 2003. So the minister said he couldn't say it was compatible, um, but wanted to go ahead anyway. So um, the provision which he thought might be incompatible in the end was found um, to be compatible, right? Um, so that, that, that went to, that, that went to the, the House of Lords. There are other... Um, there are various opinions about how worthwhile it is to have these declarations of incompatibility. So um, you draft a law and that doesn't make sure that it will be um, compatible with the ECHR. For example, the Terrorism Act 2000, a statement of compatibility was made in relation to that, but it was later found to be incompatible. Well, the Anti-Terrorism Crime and Security Act of 2001. Um, so this allowed detaining foreign citizens without any time limit if they were suspected of um, being concerned in terrorism. Uh, and the Minister of the Crown said that it was compatible with the ECHR, but the House of Lords said different. So um, the, the main benefit of Section 19 is that there's just another stage of uh, scrutiny here. So let's look at um, uh, scrutiny. There's a Joint Committee on Human Rights, and that takes MPs and peers, and they look at human rights issues within the UK, they examine all draft legislation to try and ensure it's compatible with human rights. Um, OK, then there's the Devolution of Human Rights Act 1998. So lots of devolution legislation was passed 
uh, pertaining to Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales. And it said that these uh, legislatures had to act in a manner that was a continent with the ECHR. Um, so that made them different from Westminster, because under Section 21 of the Human Rights Act, legislation passed by the devolved uh, legislatures is secondary legislation. So uh, these are subordinate legislatures, they're not sovereign, only Westminster is sovereign. So the Scottish Parliament is bound by the ECHR. Um, so uh, if, if a court rules that Scottish parliamentary legislation um, goes against the ECHR, then that legislation is struck down by a court, which you couldn't do to Westminster legislation. Now it gets um, even more confusing because um, there's the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, um, Officially, it's actually the Belfast Agreement, and it, it said that we they have to stick to the ECHR. So um, anyway, so some people said there ought to be a British Bill of Rights. Um, um, remember, um, the ECHR doesn't say that member states actually have to put it into their national law. Should they or should they not? Uh, you know, the UK was, was fully signed up to it in 1953, but to, to, to 1998 to put it into their domestic law. And that's part of the reason why countries like Belarus can break it willy-nilly. So some people were against the um, uh, Human Rights Act right from the start. So people said there was no need to do it, or that it would make the judiciary ever mighty. It would necessarily drag them into political rows. Um, but anyway, the, the, the uh, Human Rights Act had cross-party support. So some people said we ought to get rid of it, it ought to be reformulated, things like that. The Conservative Party mostly said it's, it's wrong, it's a sort of a criminal's charter, it's make this the roles of public bodies, particularly the police, almost impossible. But uh, so it's let with, led with, met with acclamation from some quarters and, and condemnation from others. So people's, the Human Rights Act is something which, which is an evolving organism. So um, Gordon Brown, who was Prime Minister in 2007, um, suggested various constitutional reforms but this is what Gordon Brown said. A British Bill of Rights and Duties would provide explicit recognition that human rights come with responsibilities and must be exercised in a way that respects the human rights of others. It would build on the basic principles of the Human Rights Act, but make explicit the way in which democratic society's rights have to be balanced with obligations. So um, the Tory manifesto 2010 said it would get rid of the HRA, but uh, then they came in and they actually didn't do that. They did establish a commission on the Bill of Rights that uh, produced a report, but um, there wasn't a cross-party consensus and the reforms got nowhere. So um, again in 2015, uh, the Conservatives said they would repeal the Human Rights Act in their manifesto, but again the Conservative government failed to do so. Didn't mention it in 2017 or 2019, but there's talk of it now. So what's happened more recently? There was a joint political declaration uh, which said the following in 2019, uh, which was about um, how the UK was going to interact with the EU. Listen to this. The future relationship should, should incorporate the United Kingdom's continued commitment to respect the framework of the European Convention on Human Rights, while the Union and its member states will be bound by the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, which reaffirms the rights as they result, in particular, from the ECHR. So even though the UK was going to leave the EU, we're still going to um, ab abide by the ECHR, remembering that the ECHR is not an EU piece of, well, what would I say, draftsmanship. It's not quite legislation, not an EU convention. It predates the EU. It even predates the EEC, the European Economic Community. Remember, the EEC was the forerunner of the EU. The EEC just changed its name into the EU, but also changed its nature. So um, there was a general election in 2019, and the Queen gave a speech in Parliament, uh, and it said a constitution, democracy, and rights commission will be established. I'm not sure if it has been, actually. So um, in, in 2019, the Conservative Manifesto said they would update the Human Rights Act to ensure there's a proper and effective balance between the rights of individuals, our vital national security, and our effective government. So that stopped the short of doing away with the HRA. So we see that these, these um, debates are always going on. Um, anyway, the United Kingdom um, was uh, deeply concerned in actually writing the ECHR originally. So um, what would a, a British Bill of Rights be? How different would it be? It's a moot point. I haven't seen a, um, a draft proposal. All right, so that's enough about the ECHR and a British Bill of Rights. Toodaloo.